Okay, uh, James, let me just recap real fast. won't go back as far as I, I have been, but in, in chapter 1, verse 19, through chapter 2, verse 13, there is James, he's calling his readers, these Jewish Christians who are outside of Palestine, who are being oppressed by uh, their rich, unbelieving neighbors. He calls them in 119 to 213 to be doers of the word with regard to their hostility toward their oppressors. It's being manifested in both anger and evil speech. And with regard to their favoring the rich at the expense of the poor. And you see that in, in chapter 2. Then in chapter 2, verse 14 to 26, he defends that call to obedience. See, he's been telling them, be doers of the word, not hearers only. You have to stop this anger and this evil speech and this uh, dishonoring of the poor in your attempt to curry favor with the rich. Well, then he defends that call against this circulating false doctrine that works or obedience is insignificant or irrelevant to salvation or for those in Christ. That it has that, that those in Christ that all that is needed is simply a mental assent to certain facts or propositions, believing certain things are true. It's what we call faith only, is our phrase for that. Where someone says, I can divorce my life from my faith, it's simply a matter of intellectual assent to propositions. And it's not a matter of the will. And so having called them strongly to obedience, he now explains or defends that call against this circulating false doctrine that almost certainly was based on a distortion of Paul's teaching. And he does that in 14 to 26. And he shows that that doctrine is wrong, this distortion of Paul's teaching. He shows that's wrong from an everyday example, you know, lip service to the poor, from the fate of demons, and then he shows it to them from Scripture. And then in light of that error that he's been addressing, that error that he's been defending his call to works against, in light of that error error in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he issues a, a caution regarding teachers. And it just fits, you see, he's been talking about this uh, distorted teaching. So now he issues a caution regarding teachers. And he says that not many of them should become teachers because teachers will receive a stricter judgment. And given the, the potential for stumbling with the tongue, you see, there's a large potential for that. Given the difficulty of controlling the tongue, they have that s- a significant potential for stumbling. So you have two things. You have... Teachers are going to be subject to a stricter judgment. And well, why does that matter? Because there is difficulty in controlling the tongue. And when you're teaching, you're running your mouth. So there is a great chance of stumbling that way. So he says, not many of you should be teachers. So he's telling them, he issues this caution to them about that. And together, see, this means that they have to give careful consideration before becoming a teacher And this is a not-so-veiled rebuke at those who were behind this false doctrine that he's dealing with. Obviously, this has currency, and it's getting circulation somewhere. So he says, not many of you should become teachers. You see, because those who teach are going to be judged more strictly, and it's a tough thing to control the tongue, so you have a significant potential for stumbling in that regard. So he issues this caution to them. Then in chapter 3, verses 3 through the first part of verse 5, He says caution is needed in becoming a teacher not only because a teacher faces stricter judgment and has a significant potential for stumbling or risk of stumbling, not only because of that, but also because teaching has a great influence on the church's spiritual course. That's this stuff about the bit in the horse's mouth and the rudder of the ship, that this little thing can wind up controlling and directing a very large thing. And so he says, look, you have to be... Uh, careful in becoming a teacher, not only because of these risks of judgment and this potential for error, but also because of the tremendous, the potential for influence there. The tongue is a little thing, but it can indeed boast tremendous effects, just like the rudder of a ship, this massive ship. And you have this little rudder that, what can it do? It can turn the entire thing. And so this is, he's issuing this caution for teachers, and I talked about that last week. Then in the second part of verse 5 in chapter 3, he turns, begins to turn the discussion to the division that exists among his readers. These Jewish Christians outside of Palestine he's writing to, they are divided. 
and there's quarreling and this kind of thing. He begins to turn his attention to that, and that's where I want to pick back up. Okay, he says in 3, 5, second part through verse 12, See how a fire of small size ignites a forest of great size? And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness placed among our members. It stains the entire body and sets on fire the course of life and is set on fire by hell. For all kinds of beasts and birds of reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no man is able to tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made according to God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth the sweet and the bitter from the same opening? My brothers, can a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine figs? Neither can a salt spring produce sweet water. So James, he uses this reference to the tongue's influence to turn this discussion now to the division that exists among his readers. And it seems that the division was at least to some extent stimulated by the oppression they were experiencing. It was somehow traceable to that. James 5, 9, and 10, it puts their grumbling against one another in that context. So it seems that, that this is partly uh, coming out or tied to their circumstance that they're experiencing, this oppression that they're facing at the hands of their rich, unbelieving neighbors. And the tongue, he says, it's, the tongue is not only influential, but it's very destructive. A little fire can wind up burning down what? Burning down a great forest. Right? You start with just a little fire, this tiny little thing, and it can wind up just consuming you know, hundreds of thousands of acres. And we've seen that, of course, in Arizona. And then he says, and the tongue is a fire. So it has tremendous destructive potential, this tongue, you see. Now, contrary to pure and undefiled religion, which requires one to keep oneself unspotted by the world. You remember he said that in chapter 1, verse 27? Pure and undefiled religion, it requires one to keep oneself unspotted by the world. Well, contrary to that, the tongue stains the entire person and wreaks havoc throughout one's life. Now, Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11 and verses 18 and 19, that what comes out of a person's mouth is what makes him unclean. See, this is, this is serious business. What comes out of a person's mouth is what makes him unclean. And in elaborating, he noted that the mouth expresses the heart in which are found evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So this is a serious thing. And in saying that the tongue is set on fire by hell, you see, he says, look, the tongue is a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. It stains the entire body, contrary to you know, what he said in 127, pure and undefiled religion. It stains the entire body and sets on fire the course of life. And then he says, and is set on fire by hell. I think in saying it's set on fire by hell that he's saying that the sinful speech, it ultimately leads to judgment where the tongue along with the entire person experiences the fire of hell. So, it, I mean, it's at that level. Now, there's an alternate way you could look at it. He may be saying that the tongue derives its destructive power, its fire, in a figurative sense. It just derives its destructive power, its fire, from Satan who's the one who's most intimately associated with hell. See, in other words, he, when he says, uh, fire the course of life and is set on fire, it gets its destructive power by hell, hell being kind of a stand-in for Satan, who's the one who's most closely associated with it. I can see that as a possibility, and in that case, he'd be saying, look, the destructive power of the tongue is from Satan, who's exploiting that avenue of sinfulness. He takes it and then uses it to create destruction. So that's a possibility, but in either case, you see that it's serious business. You know, it's not something you sit and say, oh, yeah, so, you know, that, it's, it's like a minor, minor thing. 
It's very destructive, very damaging, and very serious. And we have to get a grip on that and understand that. In verses 7 and 8, he reminds us that the tongue is extremely difficult to bring under control. He'd indicated that before. Very difficult to bring the tongue under control. Mankind's prowess in taming things, it's evident in all the creatures that man has, has tamed. You know, mankind has tamed all kinds of things. And we think that, you know, these stupid people back thousands of years ago, they were too stupid to train animals. You know, it's like, come on. You know, he's telling you, no, just like we, you, you know all the animals that we have tamed. You see, that mankind has great prowess at that, but no man can thoroughly subdue the tongue. No man can thoroughly subdue the tongue. It's a restless evil in the sense it just won't quit. Uh, you had to have experienced that. It just won't quit. You see, just when you think you've mastered it, you find yourself lying or boasting or flattering or gossiping or slandering or abusing or cursing or speaking obscenely and on and on. You see, it, it's something here. He says, look, no man can bring this under control. Under control, it's this restless evil. It's a thing that won't quit. Just when you think you've mastered it, you'll be going, man. <laughs> you see? Out comes something like that. Well, regarding his statement that no man is able to tame the tongue, I like this comment from Douglas Moo in his commentary. He says, does James and or the New Testament as a whole envisage the possibility of Christians attaining perfection in this life? We have answered this question in the negative. It does not. James does indeed suggest that the ultimate taming of the tongue is impossible. Should this lead us to abandon all efforts to bring our speech under control? Of course not. The realization that perfection is unattainable should not dampen in the least our enthusiasm to become as good as it is possible. We may never reach the point where the tongue is perfectly controlled, but we can surely advance a long way in using our speech to glorify God. See, so I don't want you to sit there and say, well, it's impossible. Who cares? That's no excuse not to wrestle with this and not to take it seriously and not to just say, so what? It's only talk. It's only words. No, we have to work to bring our speech under control to the fullest extent that we're able to do so. Now, in the case of James's addressees, the per per people to whom he's writing, these Christians, some of them, obviously, were using the tongue to curse others. Now, James doesn't specify in verses 9 through 12 that the cursing was being directed at other Christians. But I think that's what's, what was going on because there clearly were conflicts and quarrels among members of the community. You can see that in chapter 4, verse 1. They clearly were speaking against one another. You see that in chapter 4, verse 11. And they clearly were grumbling against one another. You see that in chapter 5, verse 9. So I think what he's directing here, he's directing his focus on this kind of, uh, this kind of cursing of one another, of, of their fellow Christians, and perhaps the financial pressure brought on by the economic oppression. He doesn't say this, I know that. But I'm just trying to put myself in the circumstance of what's going on here, and perhaps this, the, the financial pressure that was brought on by their economic oppression, by these rich unbelievers, caused some of them to become stingy and to love the world in the sense of focusing on unduly on how to gain more financial security. Well, maybe that's what's going on, and this may have caused complaining and bitterness and divisions within the community. Whereas we're getting the hammer, we're being economically oppressed, we're suffering financially, so we pull in and become stingy and start mistreating one another and not being kind to one another, not sharing with one another, not being family to one another. And so maybe that breeds heartache, resentment, and this kind of thing. Maybe that's what's lying behind it. At least that would fit the circumstance that we know of the letter here. So, you know, you, you see this in... in uh, th these divisions happening, that may have caused that. Now, the warning about grumbling against one another is given in the context of exhorting them to patience in the face of suffering. You see that in chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. So there, don't grumble against one another. Be patient in the face of this suffering. So there is a context where you see the grumbling does seem to be connected 
to what they're experiencing. Now, I think that in chapter 3, verses 6 through 12, he is beginning to address this disharmony among the believers, that there's this division, this fighting, this disharmony, and he's going, that's going to occupy him through chapter 4, verse 12. Now, what he says about cursing, of course it would apply to cursing non-Christians who also made or in the image of God. It would apply to them, but I think his focus and his interest is in the fighting and the quarreling and the cursing that is taking place among the community to which he's writing. Now, cursing isn't simply abusive language. You know, we, that's how we think of it. You know, we usually think of it as dirty words. You see, but that's not really what's involved. It's not simply abusive language. It is in the sense James means calling in anger for God to cut a person off from any possible blessing and to consign the person to hell. That's what it is. That's what when I curse you, I am saying for God to cut you off from any blessing and to consign you to hell, it is, an, it is an act of anger and hatred that I want the worst to befall you. That's what a curse is. I want the worst thing to happen to you. More generally, it's calling from ill will for harm to befall another person. Something like we would say, I wish you would die. You see? That's cursing somebody. I wish you would die. You see the hostility? Do you see what's reflected in that? And so here you have this kind of fighting that's going on. Now, Christians are to bless those who curse them. Now, think of that. I got somebody sitting here going, I wish you would die. And your heart and spirit is to be, may God bless you with good things. Ooh, <laughs> think of that. That's just easy to say. But put in that thing, and you you know, I don't know if you're like me, the reaction is, somebody says that to you, and it's, yeah, well, I got something for you, <laughs> you know? If not, slug them. You see, and he says, no, that's, that's not how you're to be. You see, we're to bless those who curse. But that apparently, you see, that, that command and that truth that we're to bless those who curse us, it apparently doesn't mean that cursing is always wrong. Paul, as an example, Paul, for example, used curse-like formulas. You can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. So it seems there's a parallel with the prohibition against anger. Just as there is an anger that is acceptable and right, because Jesus was angry. But there's an anger that is wrong, the anger that, to which we typically succumb. You see, it seems there's a parallel in cursing. It seems it's sinful to call for divine judgment out of a sense of personal affront. But it is not sinful to do so for the vindication of God's glory and purpose. Let me read to you what a commentator, Peter Davids, in his commentary says, In the New Testament, one finds the words of Jesus forbidding cursing, Luke 6, 28, as well as those of Paul, as well as those of Paul, Romans 12, 14, but apparently such prohibitions were not interpreted as absolute in all circumstances. For Paul certainly expressed at least curse-like formulas. And Jude, to name another example, is virtually a long curse pronouncement on certain teachers. What James appears to be referring to is the use of a curse in anger, especially in inner church party strife. And see, this is what I think he's, he's talking about. Here are these people. He knows the context. He knows that what they're doing is wrong. It is this kind of, I wish you would die. How dare you treat me this way? You see, I wish you would go ahead and die. And so he knows, and he's saying to them, listen, that's not how you are to be. And James says that such cursing, it's incompatible with the nature of the Christian. That's what all this is down at the bottom here. When he sits here and he says, you know, out of the same mouth comes blessing or cursing. That's not to be. He says, my brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour, uh, pour forth the sweet and the bitter from the same opening? And the answer, the implied answer is, is no. It's totally out of place to pour forth from our mouths the water of praise to God and then later from the same mouth to pour forth the bitter water of cursing. He says this is simply... Uh, not how it's to be. It's contrary to our nature. 
to, from, to pour out praise to God and then to turn around and curse those who are made in God's likeness. You know, there's a disconnect between those two things. Natural springs don't, don't alternate that way. And he says, look, it's, it's as contrary to a Christian's nature to curse others as it would be for a fig tree to produce olives. That's how contrary to your nature it is. For a fig tree to produce olives, for a grapevine to produce figs, or for a salt spring to produce fresh water. It is contrary to the nature of those things to do it, just as it is contrary to the nature of a Christian to both praise God and to curse those made in God's likeness. You see, that's what he's talking about. So this is a very high calling for us as Christians. That this is to be our spirit, this is to be our attitude. That we are to bless those who curse us. We are not to curse other people in the sense he's talking about. You see, that's wrong. Then he says in 3.13 to 18, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good behavior his achievements in humility born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and rivalry in your heart, do not boast and do not lie against the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and rivalry, there's disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the crop of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So continuing this instruction regarding uh, sins of division, he warns his readers about envy and rivalry. You know, you know this thing. Uh, po some politicians make an art form out of this, you know, stoking this idea. But envy and rivalry, this idea that I, I resent that you have something, whether it be a position or goods or anything, I ought to have that. You see, and then rivalry, this kind of competitive where I want to push you down so I can then rise up. You see, so he's addressing, he's, oh, you say, well, how, how could that be happening in a church? Come on. How could that be happening among Christians? Well, there it is. <laughs> there it is. You see, so the idea of the Word of God and the Spirit of God is saying it ought not be happening. And he calls them. He calls them to stop this. So apparently envy and rivalry here were being cloaked with a claim of wisdom. That seems to me to be what's going on here. That you have these people who are engaging in envy and rivalry and they're cloaking it in a claim of wisdom. In other words, it seems that envy and rivalry were being spun as appropriate exercises of wisdom. No, no, no. This is simply wisdom expressing itself. And he's going to put his finger on it and say, don't give me that nonsense. This is envy and rivalry. It has nothing to do with godly wisdom. James says that those who are wise and understanding of the things of God, they will exhibit that wisdom in what? In humble behavior. The opposite of envy and rivalry. In humble behavior. Who's wise and understanding? Let him show by good behavior his achievements in humility born of wisdom. Let him live a humble life and demonstrate that he truly is wise because wisdom breeds humility. Divine wisdom breeds humility. So he tells them, listen, those who are wise and understanding will exhibit that in humble behavior but those with envy and rivalry in their hearts, they have no business boasting of being wise. You see, when he sits here, he says, but if you have bitter envy in your rivalry in your heart, do not boast. You're going, who would boast about that? <laughs> Apparently, they were boasting. How were they doing that? They were turning it and saying it is somehow a manifestation, manifestation of wisdom. You see, they were trying to co-opt wisdom as a defense for their conduct. And he says, nonsense. You see, have none of that. You see, the, those with envy and rivalry in their hearts have no business boasting of being wise. In doing so, they contradict the truth that wisdom breeds humility. That's where he says here, 
But if you have bitter envy and rivalry in your heart, do not boast and do not lie against the truth. Well, in what way? Because if you who are engaging in envy and rivalry are claiming that as wisdom, you are lying against the truth that divine wisdom generates humility. Not envy and rivalry, humility. That is how God calls us to be and to live as humble people. And here we have people who are going the other way and trying to spin things. Now, whatever wisdom they have, he says, look, it's not from above. Whatever wisdom these people are claiming, it's not from above, it's demonic. Now, how would you like to have the Spirit of God say that? What you're claiming in trying to justify envy and rivalry, wrapping it in the cloak of wisdom, he says, whatever wisdom you're claiming, it is demonic. Its demonic origin is shown by the fact that what? Envy and rivalry, see, born of their, quote, wisdom, produce disorder and every evil practice. That's his demonstration that what they're doing is demonic. The wisdom that they claim is demonic. You see, he says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for, for where there is envy and rivalry, what do you get? Disorder and every evil practice. The environment... You see, the environment of envy and rivalry doesn't just stay there. It creates this environment where all kinds of things happen. All kinds of things happen. You see, disorder and every evil practice. You see, whether you want to say that's little or not, you get the idea that he's saying, listen, envy and rivalry, that environment is spiritually devastating because what grows up in that environment is every evil practice. Not just envy and rivalry. You see, that's the, that, that's the field that then produces all kinds of other things. Do you see how serious it is? You say, why would the Spirit of God be on this? Because it's so serious. And we just don't think of it that way. Ah, envy, rivalry, who cares? Stir it up, use it for all kinds of reasons. No, it's, it's serious, significant, dangerous, bad. Then he says that those who are those possessing true wisdom, he says, true wisdom, they're first and foremost pure. You see, they are unadulterated in their pursuit of the things of God. They're not double-minded. You remember in chapter 1, that idea of the person who's double-minded, a foot in the world and a foot in the church, can't decide where his allegiances lie? That can, well, that's not divine wisdom. See, divine wisdom is the person's pure, unadulterated in their devotion to God. On board, understand that this is how we're to be and live. Peaceable, gentle, compliant. You see, they make peace because they are gentle and compliant. They're deferential. They're not combative. Just looking to start an argument and to fight about everything. That's how I communicate the personality I'm trying to get across. <laughs> right? You get the idea. That has nothing to do with the wisdom of God. You see, they are gentle and compliant. They are deferential. You see, they're willing to go along. You see, when unalterable principles are not involved, it's a joy to work with them. Why? Because they're easy. You know, it's not like everything's life and death. Now, there are unalterable principles. Everybody understands that. But you, when things like those aren't involved, you know, they're, they're deferential, easy to work with. Paul's a good example, 1 Corinthians 9, 22. I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. You know, he's pretty easy. <laughs> you see, and that's what he's talking about in this, this divine wisdom. This divine wisdom, those possessing true wisdom are full of mercy and good fruits, impartial. They exhibit mercy, kindness, and honor without prejudice to their neighbors. Unlike the way these people had been treating the poor man. You remember the poor man? Here comes the rich man in chapter 2. He comes in. They want to curry favor with him. And what do they say to the poor guy? Hey, you know, dirt bag, hit the bricks. You I will dishonor and shame before people. Because I don't care about you at all. 
And we don't even catch that, you see, because we're not really an honor-shame society and don't really appreciate how big it was to dishonor somebody. So here's this guy sitting there. Hey, you, dude, get out. Let the guy with the fancy clothes sit here. You see, and so he's saying that's not uh, the wisdom from above. See, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial. And this produces what? What what is this? This produces unity and goodwill. Contrary to envy and rivalry, which is a field for every evil practice, this produces unity and goodwill. You see, and then he says that those possessing true wisdom are sincere. They're genuine, acting without show or pretense, not phony. You know, (laughs) Hey, yeah, praise the Lord, great. But a phony, okay? No, no room for that. That's not divine wisdom. That's worldly, earthly, that's the kind of stuff that's demonic. Now, those who are peacemakers are thereby, they are sowing a crop, see, because this produces unity and goodwill. Those who are peacemakers are thereby, in that process of creating unity and goodwill, making peace, creating bonds, those who are peacemakers are thereby sowing a crop of righteousness because an environment of peace and harmony is conducive to righteousness just as an environment of envy and rivalry is conducive to every evil practice. So when you contribute to the environment of peace, you are sowing righteousness because the field that you are creating, the environment that you are creating is conducive to righteousness just as the field of envy and rivalry, that practice produces an environment that's conducive to every evil practice. You see, these things are connected. So he says here, look, those who are peacemakers are sowing a crop of righteousness. That's how they're doing it. Because they are creating and contributing to an environment in which righteousness thrives. This this environment, yeah, yeah, yeah. Little pieces, disunity, struggles, fighting, one-upmanship, all that junk. You see, what does that create? Every, every evil practice. This idea of unity and peace and harmony and love and mutual honor and respect and going along, that creates an environment where righteousness thrives. You see, and that's what I think he's after. He's telling them this is bigger and deeper than they understand. He says in chapter 4, 1 to 3, What is the source of conflicts and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your pleasures that battle in your members? You want and do not have, so you kill and are filled with jealousy. You are unable to obtain, so you quarrel and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly that you may spend it on your pleasures. Douglas Moo in his commentary says, The quarrels of James's day have too often marred the Christian church. There's a 17th century Jewish philosopher, Baruch Spinoza. He said this, Jewish philosopher, 17th century, I've often wondered that persons who make boast of professing the Christian religion, namely love, joy, peace, temperance, and charity to all men, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and display daily towards one another such bitter hatred that this, rather than the virtues which they profess, is the readiest criteria of their faith. Now that is a, that is a nasty, nasty indictment. Now, I remember six years ago, the Christian Chronicle had an interview with a man named Kevin Bethea. He was a Pentecostal preacher who had resigned his ordination in that group after becoming convinced that the beliefs of those in churches of Christ were more in line with the scriptures. So here was a seeker. He saw that. He said, I think that's right. I think the people who call themselves the church of Christ, they're more in line with the scriptures. I'm going to resign my ordination with this group, with this uh, uh, Pentecostal group. So he wound up in 95, he planted the East Baltimore Church of Christ, and 10 years later he had 35 people. 10 years later that congregation had grown to over 350 people. So he's being interviewed uh, six years ago in the Christian Chronicle. And the interviewer says, what happened when you turned in your Church of God licenses and credentials to the bishop? 
But they answered, I told him I was leaving. He said, you don't want to go over to those people. I said, why? He said, you don't know about those Church of Christ people. They fight about everything. They'll fight about the color of the drapes. That's not good. You see, that's not good. Just not the spirit that I see James saying and communicating. See, even when a battle must be fought, that must be done without sacrificing Christian principles and virtues. You see, it has to be done that way, even when a battle has to be fought. But I fear that too often the battles are about a line along the lines of the color of the drapes. Just crazy stuff. You say, well, I, I, don't, like the, I don't like the color of the drapes. Who cares? <laughs> you know, I, I, John and I laugh about it. You say, Christians in the first century, well, they, they're sitting around where? Dirt floors. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to create a stir about drapes or something? I just think it's nuts, but apparently it happens. And it shouldn't happen. And I don't know what to say to stop it from happening. Because here is God as plain as the nose on my face, which is a substantial nose saying to you, this ought not be. Now what do we do with it? Do we just say what? I don't care. I don't care. I will hear this and continue to do this kind of stuff. It shouldn't be. And if I could hold my breath and turn blue and change it, I'd do it. I don't know what else to say other than say, the Spirit of God is saying to you, no place for that. Okay? And even when it's something that has to be fought, you have to maintain Christian principles and virtues in doing it. We don't get down to a street fight. We don't slander and go to politics and all that kind of junk. Why? Because we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You see? Perfect in every way, and he's our goal. Okay, so that, uh, this thing here, he says in 4, 1 to 3, I heard that first bell. All right, the conflicts and the quarrels occurring among James's readers, they're rooted in the envy and jealousy that springs from frustrated desires. He says that's the root of this, this quarreling that you have going on. These conflicts and quarrels, that's where they're rooted. Because they don't have what they want, they're filled with jealousy which leads to quarreling and fighting. I want something, I don't have it, I'm filled with jealousy, and so now we start bickering and fighting, quarreling and all this kind of thing. He says that's the root of it. You see, now James literally says in chapter 2, as I've translated here, you want to do not have, so you kill and are filled with jealousy. And that raises the question of whether the hostility within this group to which he's writing, whether the hostility there had actually gotten to the point that they literally had committed murder. Okay, I don't think so. There are some who think so. I don't think that's the case. Now, I suspect James is drawing on the teaching of Jesus in equating sinful anger with murder in Matthew 5, 21 to 26. I think he's drawing on that teaching that, as I've said before, anger is murderous in principle. That is the heart that murders. And so I think he's drawing on that, and if that teaching was well known, that would explain why he didn't have to footnote and say, by the way, I'm not speaking literally, because everybody would have known that he wasn't speaking literally. So that's one thing. Now, perhaps he referred to their current fighting and jealousy as, quote, killing. Maybe he did that because if unchecked, that's what it leads to. In other words, it's a hypothetical eventuality. Now, that, either one of those would work, and either one of those, I think, is more likely than believing that James would pass over so quickly such a serious matter as murder in the church. That's just me. <laughs> I suspect that if people in the church were killing each other, that he'd stop and say a little bit more about that and like pull his hair out and go, what, are you crazy? You know, he'd say it in his own way. That's how I'd say it. But so I, that's what I think. I don't think he's being literal there. But to the extent their frustrated desires, he says, are for things needed to serve and glorify God. Okay, to the extent your frustrated desires are for those things, they do not have because they do not ask God to provide them. That's why. You don't have those kinds of things because you do not ask God to provide them. To the extent their frustrated desires are for things to indulge their pleasures, they do not have despite asking God for them. 
You see, they don't have despite asking God for them because God doesn't honor such selfishly motivated requests. He doesn't honor that. Moo says in his commentary, Jesus had promised, ask and it will be given to you, Matthew 7, 7. But clearly Jesus had in mind that asking which has as its focus and motive God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will, Matthew 6, 9, and 10. Not an asking that had the purpose of the indulgence of those pleasures that are at war with our souls. So it's just like a parent. You know, somebody who's doing this kind of thing, wanting to indulge my pleasures and all appetites and all that stuff. I want this, I want that. Well, too bad. <laughs> too bad. He says, to the extent you don't have the things that are needed for glorifying God, it's because you haven't asked him. To the extent you don't have these things for indulging your sinful pleasures, you don't have even though you have asked him because he doesn't give you that kind of stuff. Now, that's one of the things that you and I live with in this world, in praying. You see, in praying, there are times that we have certain ideas and God's ideas are different. Now, here in chapter 4, 4 through 10, I'll read it and then I, I see that bell's going to ring. He says, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever decides to be a friend of the world is made an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? The spirit which he caused to dwell in us longs enviously but he gives greater grace. Let me just finish this. And therefore it says, God opposes the arrogant but gives grace to the humble. Be subject then to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloominess. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now you talk about somebody who can preach. He can preach. I heard that bell, thanks. 